mothers, um, anything that we can say about mothers, it's everything good and nothing bad, right? Uh, you know, I stopped to think about growing up and I can't think of anything bad that my, I, you know, any bad attitude or feelings, and I'm sure I had them, but I can't think of those things toward my mother. Now, me and my dad, we, we had our tangles uh, from time to time, but mom just always seemed to be there. Uh, she always seemed to, you know, have that shoulder to lean upon, and, and uh, she was there to, you know, clean up the scraped up knee, or she was there to, to help uh, during those you know, maybe stressful times as I began to get a little bit older and just needed to somebody to confide in it and talk with. Uh, so moms do have a very special role and a special place within their children's hearts. As they grow up and they become teenagers, many times we wonder, you know, have I had any kind of effect whatsoever? You know, they don't seem to uh, listen or they don't re uh, recall those things that we've done for them as they grow, uh, have been growing. Uh, but, you know, we, we look back on our lives as adults and I think each one of us would be able to say uh, that our moms had a special place in our hearts. I read a story about a, a six-year-old boy and his little sister, uh, she was four, and they presented their mother uh, a flower, uh, a planted, uh, potted plant for Mother's Day. Now, this potted plant uh, wasn't the, the prettiest thing. It was, you know, just kind of small and spindly. Um, although it wasn't the finest, they went and they spent their own money uh, to buy this flower for their mother. And of course, their mother, uh, she was just ecstatic and she, she thought this was the, the most beautiful flower that she'd ever seen in her life. And her children, being six and four, being very honest, was like, Mom, you know, there's, there's much prettier flowers at the flower shop that we wanted to buy you. And, uh, and Mom's like, no, this is perfect. This is just the right flower. And they said, oh, there's this one uh, that was beautiful and it had a ribbon on it and it was just for you, but we couldn't afford it. Uh, because uh, it, it said rest in peace and you're always telling us that you want us to, to just be quiet so you can rest and get your peace. Uh, you know, so often, uh, you know, children that six and four and two, you know, they say things in honesty, but often uh, there's some truth to the stories that they're telling. Uh, and, and children will help keep us as parents straightened out uh, from time to time. Uh, they will help us. But this morning, I want to focus on three things that will make an outstanding mother. I can look back and say, boy, you know, I, I had a, a great mom. You know, and, and there's times when I'd say mom was an outstanding mom. One of my biggest regrets is not all of my children got to know my mom. Uh, you know, and she passed away the same year that Seth was born. Uh, you know, so my younger children didn't get to experience my mom as grandma. But, you know, as you, you begin to think about a godly mom, I've got to look at Luke chapter 2. And although it is a, the Christmas story, I want us to read verses 1 through 7 this morning. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David." to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, as we begin to read through this passage, we, we understand that uh, Mary was the chosen one. She was the one that God had planned to uh, place the seed of the Holy Spirit upon her so that uh, Jesus Christ could be conceived within the womb of Mary and that she would be, uh, bring forth uh, the God child. Uh, she was going to be the mother of Jesus. Now I want us to make something very clear this morning and in today's society, I think this has uh, entered into some muddy waters, but just because you're allowed to give birth, it doesn't make a woman a mother. You know, there are a lot of women out there that will give birth to children, but they will never mother their children. And God wants us to be, uh, as ladies, God wants you to be a godly mother. 
It takes a special woman to be a mother. A mother is a person who is willing to take the responsibility of investing her life into the life of another human being who is totally dependent upon her to do so. And that takes effort. It takes time. It takes dedication. You know, you read stories often of mothers that have just dumped their children. You know, and it's just heartbreaking to see the heartlessness of some women. You know, we have, we have women by the millions every year taking and dumping their little child, they call a fetus, uh, at the clinic. Because they don't want the responsibility of raising a child. A gift that God has given them. And abortion has become, I believe, the greatest sin of America uh, in today's society. You know, they'll talk about how, you know, guns will kill people. And they'll talk about how, you know, kids will get involved in gangs and how they're going to get killed in gangs. And, and how that, you know, even to the point where, you know, you got to have your child in a, a child safety seat until they're 15 years old. Because they're going to die if you don't buckle them in and all these things. But they're not so concerned about the child within the mother's womb. They're not so concerned about uh, that mother killing that baby or that child. You know, we live in sad days and we, we live in a day and age where motherhood is, is very, taken for granted. It's not something that is taken seriously. The children that God gives you are a gift from God. Sometimes we wonder, <laughs> what kind of gift did God give me? But he gave you a responsibility as a mother to take and nurture and to raise that child for his honor and his glory. I read a poem. It says, the one who follows me. It says, a careful mother I ought to be. A little one is following me. I do not dare go astray for fear she'll go the self same way. I cannot once escape her eyes. Whatever she sees me do, she tries. Like me, she says, she'll, she's going to be that little one who follows me. She thinks that I am good and fine, believes in every word of mine. The base in me she must not see, that little one who follows me. I must remember as I go through summer sun and winter snow, I am building for the years to be that little one who follows me. You know, we have those children. And you see those little children holding on to mom's skirt as they're walking around the church. Or, or you see them walking through the store and that little one is holding on to mom, following mom wherever she goes. And those children are learning from that mother every step of the way. If that mother has fits of rage, that little child is going to learn those fits of rage. If mother is happy and bubbly, that little child is going to learn to be happy and bubbly. We've got to realize that we have a responsibility as parents, but especially as mothers, because you are there with your children the majority of the time. And as you are there with your children, they are they're looking and seeing and mimicking everything that you do. You've got to be careful. This morning, the first thing I want to see that's necessary to become an outstanding mother is to have a personal relationship with God. You need to have a personal relationship with God in order to be an outstanding mother. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, if you would. We're going to go back to Luke chapter 1 and 2 here in a little bit and look at Mary and break these different things down. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, the Bible says in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of the tears that I may be filled with joy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Here we see the illustration of a grandmother, a mother, and a child. And it's talking about the unfeigned faith of the grandmother. The unfeigned faith that was passed down to the mother, and now the unfeigned faith that is found in the child. We see here the importance of that, uh, you know, that, that role model, the importance of, of being that individual uh, who cares and loves 
uh, their children and is the right example of that children. But why were they, they that example? Because they were godly parents. They were godly grandparents. Back in Luke chapter 1 and verse 30, going back to the life of Mary, Mary was a person of uh, what you might call spiritual integrity. She was one that, that was uh, separated and set aside uh, from all other women uh, when God went looking for that special individual to, to have conceive the God child. We see in Luke chapter 1 verse 30, it said, The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Oh, if we as parents... And you ladies as mothers could find favor with God. You know, having children and grandchildren, as we see in, in the passage in 2 Timothy, you bear a great responsibility to find favor with God. See, when God looks down upon you and he looks for the right example, he looks for the godly example to set forth, uh, to bring forth a child or to, uh, to help with, as a grandparent, you know, how does God look at you? Is God finding favor in your life? As you try to live your life, is God of utmost importance? Is he first in your life? Is he most important in your life? Say, well, my children are my most important. If your children was most important in your life, God would be most important in your life. Because God must come first. We've got to put God first in our life. If we're not putting God first in our life, uh, we put, you know, our, our, you know, our hobbies or we put uh, something like that first. And uh, our children are going to get put to the back burner. If God is first in our life, then we're going to try to raise our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. God must come first. And if God comes first and we're walking in the ways of God, then God is going to come along and he's going to find favor with you. And we see this with Mary. Out of all the women that was walking around the face of the earth at this time, God chooses Mary. The one who finds favor with God. You know, all through the scriptures, we can see God choosing individuals that had found favor. You know, we, we can look at people like David and we can look at uh, individuals that had got, God had chosen, uh, like a Joshua. Uh, but you can also look at women like an Esther or a Ruth. You can look at a Mary. You can look at a Martha. You can look at individuals that God looked upon and, and, and seen them as friends. And he finds favor upon their lives. Why? Because God is first in their life. God must come first. Mary wasn't only a person of spiritual integrity, but Mary was a person who enjoyed being in the presence of God. Look at uh, chapter 1 again of Luke. Verses 46 and 47, it says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. In her life, she was just magnified at the fact that the, the presence of God comes upon her and she can joy in that. You know, as, as you ladies come to church and you've got that little child holding on to your skirt strings, will that child look at a, a, as a mother or a grandmother who loves the Lord, who magnifies the Lord? Do your children look at you as an individual that loves being in church, loves being in the presence of God? Do they come and they see that you're sitting on the edge of your seat just eager to hear what the Word of God has to say? Or is it of so little importance that they see that you sleep in church? The church isn't all that important. You've got things that are, you know, better in your life, more important in your life than being in the presence of the Holy God. See, as an individual, as a parent, do we enjoy being in the presence of our Lord? 
Do we enjoy getting up in the morning and spending our private time with our Lord? Do we enjoy praying and do we enjoy reading our Bible? Do we enjoy these things? Do our children know that we enjoy these things? Do we take time as parents to set children down uh, daily and, and get around the Word of God and family devotions and open up the Word of God and, and read a passage of Scripture and, and pray together as a family? Do our children see it important enough for us to do these things? Do we as a, a parent want to get our children wrapped around our arms in the presence of God? What's our relationship with God like? Mary was a woman that was hungry for the things of God. You know, the first thing necessary to become an outstanding mother is that personal relationship with God. The next thing, the second thing necessary is a proper relationship with your children. What kind of relationship do you have with your children? You know, Mary supported her husband's leadership. You know, I believe that as you read through scriptures, Joseph isn't mentioned a whole lot. Uh, it's believed that Joseph probably died while Jesus was in his early years. So that's why he's not mentioned often. But I believe Mary, being that woman of integrity, that woman who loved God, wanted to be obedient to God, and she followed uh, her husband's leadership. And Mary taught her children discipline in honor of God. You know, and, and as we teach and we raise our children, we ought to be disciplining our children and raising them in honor of God. You know, we don't just discipline our children because they need it. Uh, we ought to be disciplining them and, and instructing them in the way of God, honoring God's way. Raising them up the way that God wants us to raise them. In Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52, it says, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. As we see here, uh, Jesus was subject. He placed himself under the leadership of Joseph and Mary. And Mary, I believe, was a subject under her husband as well. And as a result, Jesus began to grow up and he was found in favor, not only with God, but with man. And so often I believe that our children uh, are lost in the shuffle of life. And as a result, as they grow older, you know, they're no longer found so much in favor of God and man because they're not even found in favor of, in our sight, as parents. So often parents, you know, talk about how just, you know, they're so fed up with their children. They don't understand why their children would turn out the way that they have. They don't understand why they're not listening to them. And I deal with this often. <laughs> you know, what's the problem? The problem is you didn't take it seriously when they were young enough, where they were moldable, where uh, during that time in life where they were needing that nurturing and caring and that direction uh, as far as a parent in their life. You know, they reach a certain point in life if they haven't uh, been instructed and, and cared for spiritually when they were young, what's going to happen is all you, the only opportunity and the only option you have is to pray for them, <laughs> to be a godly example to them because they've got to make that decision on their own. They've got to get to a point in their life where they realize, you know what? Um, Mom and Dad live this way. I've got to decide whether I'm going to live this way or not. And if you're a godly parent and God's blessed you in your life, why wouldn't your children want that? Why wouldn't they want God's blessing? The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child... And the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not part from it. You know, that's a promise. God commands us in the first part of the verse, train up a child in the way he should go. How should he go? Well, according to the scripture, he ought to go God's way. 
He ought to put God first in his life, in every aspect of his life. And parents, it's our responsibility to be training our children up in God's way, in the nurturing, in the admonition of the Lord. And the Bible promises that if we do this, we train them up in the way they should go. When, they were, when they're old, they will not depart from what? That training. They're not going to depart from the relationship that we've taught them in our own lives that should be important as far as we following God. They're going to grow up saying, you know what? If it works for mom and dad, it must work for me. And really, this is a big problem that we have uh, with young people today. We live in a, a second and third generation now where parents have basically coddled their children. We live in a society today where, you know, you don't have winners and losers. You know, we've trained our children that everybody ought to be treated fairly. We live in a society where everybody gets a trophy. Everybody participated, so everybody gets a participation trophy. And what's happened is we've trained our children, we've raised our children in today's society to believe that life should be fair. We've raised children to believe that they don't have to work for anything. They should just be given everything. And thus we have termed this generation the millennials. And we see through statistics that, you know, many 25, 26, 27 year olds, you know, with hundreds and hundreds and fifty thousand dollars worth of student loans because they went and got a degree or or maybe dropped out before they got the degree in something that was menial, something that really had no basis to it whatsoever. And they get out of college and realize, man, I can't really get a good paying job with this degree. So what do they do? They move back home. They continue to be coddled. They continue to be given whatever they want. Parents, we have a responsibility. Life is not fair. You know, there are things in life that we've got to realize, we've got to, uh, you know, teach and instruct our children in that life is not fair. Life at times is hard. And you've got to work through those hard times to make life better. And as a parent, it's so important for us to teach our children that because what's going to happen as they grow older and they, you know, try to live a godly life, things are going to get hard. Things aren't going to go the way they want them to go spiritually. And then they're just going to quit because it's supposed to be given to me. No, it's got to be worked for. The Christian life is not something that's just easily given. It's hard work. Now, salvation comes easy. We, we overcome uh, Satan's power through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and giving in to the Holy Spirit's conviction. We accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. But to maintain a godly life takes work. It's hard. And as parents, we must instill and instruct this into our children. So when they are old, they will not depart from it. If your children can't honor you as a parent, how are they going to grow up to honor God as their Heavenly Father? If they're not going to be obedient to you as a parent, it's likely they're not going to grow up to be obedient to God their Heavenly Father. See, as we raise our children, it's not just raising them up to be obedient to me so I can have a good relationship with them. No, we're trying to teach our children to be obedient to us and honor us as their parents so as they grow older, they're obedient to God and they're honoring to God their Father. And as they grow up to honor and obey God, as a godly parent, they're going to honor and obey us. And that relationship as they grow older is going to get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. We're not going to have the contention. You know, we're not going to have the strife battling between us and our child as they grow older. If we raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. 
See, Mary, she was faithful to her children. The Bible tells us in John chapter 19, verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. All the way to the very end, we find his mother was there by him. You know, the world was saying, crucify him. And they crucified him with the slay or with the murderer and with the thief. She knew he was innocent. But she also knew that he was brought to this earth to do and fulfill exactly what he was doing there on the cross. And even though as a mother there at the cross typically would have been shamed at the sight of their child being hung on the cross because of the heinous crime that they were accused of. She understood that Jesus was being accused of falsely. That he was the perfect child. Not the perfect child that parents claim to have, but he was the only perfect child. And she knew he had to have been innocent of any allegation that they brought against him. As she remained faithful to him to the end. We need to remain faithful to our God. Remain faithful to our children. Don't give up on your children, Mom. No matter how hard or how difficult they become, a loving parent is going to continue to pray for them. A godly mother is going to continue to love them. Encourage them in the Lord. And hopefully see them back on the right track if they wavered. If they've gone astray. A godly mom has that proper relationship with her family. A godly mother also, number three, has a willingness to serve God. A willingness to serve God. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, it says, Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She said, listen, I'm just willing to be used. It doesn't matter in what capacity. It doesn't matter what for. I'm just willing to be used. You know, today, in, in today's society, we live in such a selfish society. You know, a lot of parents, a lot of moms, a, lo uh, a lot of men, you know, want to be very selective with how they serve. They want to serve it, you know, be in service, not necessarily God's way, but their way. They want to be in the service of God, but they want the recognition. They don't want to serve to give God the recognition. You know, they're not willing to, you know, clean the toilets or the floors or to take out the trash. You know, they're not willing to help out at the work parties or they're not willing to work in the nursery. They're not willing to do these things. Typically what happens is they want, you know, to, to be in service by, you know, standing up here and singing or, or you know, doing whatever they can where everybody can notice them. See, the service of God takes a lot of people working behind the scenes in order for God's service to get done. And God is more interested in finding that person that doesn't want to be in the limelight of things, but they, he's looking for the person that's just willing to, to work in the shadows. Not to look for the recognition, but to say, God, I'm just willing to serve. In whatever capacity you want me to serve, I am willing. You know, if it's making treats for Sunday school, I'm willing to serve. If it's buying supplies to, to keep everybody in, in supplies in the bathrooms or a fellowship, I, I'm willing to serve. If it's to wipe the snotty nose of a kid down in junior church, I'm willing to serve. Do our children see that willingness? Do our children see that eagerness to serve? See, if you love the service of the king, you're going to love coming to church because this is your opportunity to serve God. 
you know, if you love the service of the king, you're going to be praying for the ministries of the king. So when the church prayer time is here, you're going to be here praying for the church and its ministries. You know, how faithful do our children find us? Do our children see us just having that love, that desire, that willingness to serve God? Do they see us taking those opportunities to just go out and do His bidding? Or is it all about me? Is it all about what I want? Or is it all about what my kids want? Is it all about taking them here and there and missing out on what God wants? See, we've got to be very careful as parents. Sometimes it's a juggling act. But we need to make sure that we're putting God first in every aspect of our lives. Let's not just be settled to be a good parent. Let's try to be godly parents. Let's strive in every aspect of our lives to have that personal relationship with God. The proper relationship with our children. But make sure that we're willing in every aspect of our life to serve Him with our whole heart. Setting that example for our children to not only learn from, but to live by.